Welcome everyone to Inspiration Talks by Densply Serona. I'm Dr. Lisa Toms and happy to be your moderator for today's program. Not only do I have this great job as Senior Manager for Clinical Affairs at Densply Serona, but I also continue to practice part-time as a prosthodontist in the Seattle area. We have an exciting session planned for you today with two world-class clinicians presenting on implants and digital workflows with a Q&A session to follow. At this time, I'm honored to introduce our first speaker who also happens to be past president of the AO and a prolific scientific author all the way from London. Please welcome Dr. Michael Norton. Hi, thank you. How exciting to be joining you from London uh, for this really um, important first ever virtual uh, corporate forum at the AO. I'm really delighted to be joining you all uh, and the whole Densply Serona family. And I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing my journey through the digital workflow world with you guys. So. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm here to talk to you today about leveraging PrimeScan, the intraoral scanner for delivery of a screw retained, digitally designed implant supported restorations. And uh, essentially uh, what I'd like to do is go through a workflow with you that includes uh, not just uh, the digital planning side of things and the digital scanning side of things, but also the incorporation of digital technologies, both at the implant and abutment level to deliver what I believe to be uh, the finest implant supported restorations that I've been able to deliver in, in my 30 years of uh, implant dentistry. And we, I think all understand uh, the importance of planning. So I'm going to share a case with you with uh, missing molars. Uh, this is the upper right first and second molar uh, positions two and three or one, six, one, seven uh, requiring a stage sinus lift. And today is not the day to be talking about sinus lifts. At least that's not my remit. So just to say that this was done on a staged basis. And this is now an acquisition image, uh, acquisition video of the sinus graft so that we can import this information into our digital Simplant uh, workflow. And Simplant, of course, is a very, very powerful technology, those that are familiar with it. Uh, we see here four windows, three in the uh, three axes, uh, and one volume render. And we can work in the two dimensional sphere to establish things like panoramic curve. And we can work in the 3D volume render sphere to, for example, as I'm doing here, using the virtual tooth tool to establish the optimal position of where teeth should be. Now, of course, this might be guided by a radiographic template, um, or it might just be guided by one's own experience. But either way, the virtual tooth tool sets out the parameters back in the 2D images as to where we want to place our implants. So you see here now the implant placement tool, uh, we're positioning the implant to optimally support the restorative uh, goal. Uh, and in this particular case, you can see I'm specifying the implant as an Astra EV 4.8. So that color codes the implant according to the platform size. And we can then go ahead and look again at this in the uh, 3D volume render and begin to appreciate that our sinus graft is well positioned to support these two implants so that they themselves can support the intended implant supported crowns. Of course, we can use this information to produce a guide. It could be a pilot guide or a fully guided surgical guide um, that can be then taken to the mouth for surgery. Now, I don't have any images of the guide, unfortunately, but these two implants have been placed in a flapless approach 
using a pilot guide through punch incisions. So these two implants uh, basically have been placed without raising any uh, flaps, no incisions, no sutures. And this for the patient provides minimal trauma and minimal mor morbidity. One of the things that I feel is, is very much overlooked in the digital world is the fact that we should be using an implant that is specifically designed for these digital technologies. And right now, as far as I can see, there is only one implant on the market that has done that, which is the AstroTech EV implant, because this is the only implant that offers you a one position only site specific index really designed for utilizing site-specific uh, abutments, CAD-CAM abutments. It also means that in the prime scan technology, we can index this one specific uh, position. As you can see, it, the uh, inside of the implant here, the splines uh, that engage with the abutment. So the scan flow is an asymmetrical seven-sided index in effect, which records this unique one position. Intraoral scanning, of course, has been a, a, a long-running uh, saga in terms of technological development. And there are, of course, many options on the market uh, for scanners. Uh, but it seems uh, that we now have in prime scan a really state of the art uh, piece of equipment that provides phenomenal information with uh, many tens of thousands of images captured per second at quite full depth so that we're able to capture all of this information, including the byte registration, of course. Uh, and one of the reasons that I finally adopted uh, intraoral scanners is that I actually had a patient, the patient that I'm uh, taking you through now, who we were 90% of the way through an analog impression using Infragum. I was just starting to put my hands in his mouth to unscrew the guide pins when he started gagging violently. And in fact, this individual who's a big fella became so aggressive that he pushed me out of the way, literally knocked me over and in his panic gripped the impression tray and ripped it out of his mouth, ripping the tray off the uh, impression copings and in the process fracturing the core of a crown tooth on the opposite side. So the whole tooth came out or the whole crown of the tooth came out in the impression. And he was, as you might uh, appreciate, so distressed as was I, that we agreed that we couldn't do another analog impression. And so this is what persuaded me to at least look into uh, the prime scan. And in fact, this is the very first prime scan impression I ever took. And it's quite uh, impressive, I have to say. It certainly blew me away. And it also blew the patient away for its quality and its clarity, both of the implants, the mucosa and the dentition. And in fact, if you look on the uh, contralateral side, you'll see here uh, the uh, upper left uh, last standing molar has been fractured at root level. And that I'm afraid was the tooth that got ripped out uh, with the analog impression. And again, these implants have been orientated using a one position only site specific uh, flow or scan flag. And so these can now be utilized in the uh, digital arena to fabricate a unique site-specific abutment. We can also, of course, register the bite and we get a really uh, valuable uh, map of the bite registration, giving us information on high spots and low spots. And of course, therefore allowing my technician to understand how he can build 
these implants into a protected occlusion, especially in a big patient with big masseters and a very heavy bite like this patient has. It allows us to take shade information and whilst not necessarily 100% accurate, I have found this to be a very valuable guide uh, to get me started uh, in the process of shade taking. Uh, it's certainly a good starting point. The printed models, I have to say, have impressed me uh, to the extent that they are dimensionally very accurate. I've worked for years with Natherstone, and although I've always been uh, impressed with my technician's abilities to provide me with crowns with good contact points and refined occlusion, the truth of the matter is that I've, since using the Prime Scan, had to do virtually minimal, if any, adjustments to the occlusion or the contact points on the crowns that have been fabricated on these printed models. So we are introducing a whole new level of dimensional accuracy. That information is then sent to Atlantis and using the virtual abutment design software, you see here we can start to fabricate abutments with different emergence profiles, different core sizes, core tapers, uh, different uh, margin positionings. Uh, in fact, today I'm pretty much routinely using the custom base abutments, which are screw retained. So the crowns are going to be bonded in the lab and the whole structure is going to be screw retained. Um, and so these margins can actually be placed deep uh, into the soft tissues because we're not having the issue of removing cement uh, intraorally. And here you can see uh, the two screw retained crowns placed in a protected occlusion, so there's slight clearance. And if we use the Atlantis reangulating screws, they happen to come with quite small screw heads. And so we can get very small holes through the ceramic or through the zirconia that we have here, uh, which means they're very easy to mask. Um, and to be honest, you wouldn't really know that there were any screw holes there. The transition zone from abutment to zirconia and layered porcelains, as you see here, is really very fine. And this means minimal irritation to the soft tissues. And certainly with a group of colleagues in Italy, we've published a, a couple of studies now uh, up to four years in function where we're showing the most incredible biological and mechanical stability for these Atlantis abutments. And here you see in the mouth, it's impossible almost to see where the screw access holes are. Uh, and these provide really phenomenally high quality and biologically stable restorations. And then if we now take the final uh, radiograph, we can very quickly see how that ties back into our original digital plan, placing everything exactly as was intended before we uh, commenced with surgery. Here's another example that I want to share very quickly. This is a patient who during the first COVID lockdown under the stress of it all, managed to fracture uh, two premolars. Um, and so her bicuspids, her second bicuspids, one each side, uh, were removed and we proceeded with immediate implant placement. And my personal preference is to use the uh, direct abutment as a temporary abutment. And then we uh, fabricate shell, uh, ham fabricated temporary crowns uh, using shells uh, chair side. And in fact, as you can see on the distal cervical margin of the upper left premolar, we can adjust the contour. So I've actually under contoured that crown. You see a small gap to the gingival margin. And this is to encourage the soft tissue to come down a bit there to give me a better uh, scalloped architecture and perhaps a more defined distal papilla there. And here you can see the two implants placed very precisely to the floor of the sinuses with these temporary direct abutments in place. Some uh, 
three months later, now in lockdown number three, uh, but thankfully we were allowed to stay open. Uh, she came back and uh, we went through a prime scan uh, as we discussed before. And here are her two beautiful prime scan images. I, I have to say patients love to see these images and I think they might help to sell more dentistry in the long term because they provide a phenomenally good opportunity to point out defects or deficiencies that may exist with existing restorations or with the patient's own teeth. Patients really appreciate being able to see their mouths in this way. Uh, and so I do think that these intraoral scanners uh, may be a very valuable tool uh, for encouraging patients to uh, improve their mouths further. And again, this patient we took to the uh, virtual abutment design for Atlantis custom base uh, abutments. And the other thing to say is that in the laboratory, the technicians are also working in the digital world. So we're utilizing ExoCAD for digital articulation and also to fabricate uh, fully contoured or three quarter contoured uh, zirconia crowns that can then be layered on the buccal surfaces with porcelain, uh, depending, I guess, on one's uh, technician's uh, preferences. And, and this really sort of completes the circle in, in terms of a digital workflow, because now the superstructures are themselves being milled from a digital design. And here we see the two uh, crowns on their Atlantis custom base abutments. And in this case, we've got this gold hue, uh, which is the titanium nitride color, uh, the gold color, which uh, gives a better shine through the soft tissues. And once again, we can establish these really superb emergence profiles. And there's virtually no ledge between where the crown uh, meets the abutment margin. It's a perfect transition zone. Uh, and uh, for me, undoubtedly, the soft tissue response uh, is impeccable. It's often the case that we cannot probe between the soft tissues and these restorations. And if we can, we're struggling to get beyond two millimeters. So here we see the two crowns uh, secured intraorally. Uh, and initially we place uh, a temporary wadding and we wait for three months, at which point we bring the patient back, check that the uh, preload has uh, not been lost before we finally place our permanent uh, composite filling. I have to say I'm in the middle of another two year study with custom base abutments and it is extremely rare to find that there is any loss of preload these restorations are mechanically uh, very stable. And here you see the finished uh, radiographs, the final radiographs. And of course, the left radiograph gives me a fantastic opportunity to point out the importance of emergence profile, to use an implant that's specifically meant for a particular tooth size in terms of its diameter, to have an emergence profile of the abutment that is gentle so that there is a gradual contouring from the implant diameter through to the full contour of the uh, implant supported restoration. And if you compare that to the quite aggressive emergence profile on these two Straumann implants that have served the patient very well and were placed many years ago. But it's very clear to me that when we probe around implants with those kind of emergence profiles, we do get deep pockets. And we know that deep pockets mean anaerobic bacteria and those bacteria ultimately can lead to uh, problems such as mucositis or peri-implantitis. And to that very point, um, I would like to share with you a brand new uh, study that has just been published in the Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Implants, where I did a systematic review and meta-analysis 
to look at the marginal bone levels when comparing the surfaces of three premium brand implants, those being, of course, Astra, Nobel and Straumann. Now, they have three very unique surfaces in terms of tyanite, SLA or SL active and osseous speed. And so I was curious to know if we did a meta-analysis, would there be any difference in outcome? And so my null hypothesis was that they would all show a comparable marginal bone loss. In fact, uh, I was very pleasantly surprised to discover that the AstroTech implant with its osseous speed surface yields a statistically significant uh, improvement in maintenance of marginal bone levels uh, when compared to the other two implants. Uh, so I would refer you to this recently published study um, because I think it raises some important issues uh, about the surface of the implant. That all said, uh, I want to finish where I started and say to you that after 30 years of doing implant dentistry, uh, I'm in absolutely no doubt that this digital workflow is delivering for me the finest implant supported restorations that I've been able to provide my patients throughout that time. I hope it's been of value to you. I hope you've enjoyed listening and I hope you enjoy this Academy of Osseo Integration annual virtual conference. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that perfect presentation. I do have a few questions for you, but first, may I get your autograph? <laughs> uh, we'll figure that out later. Okay, let's get back to the questions. My first question is, it sounds like there was a really traumatic patient experience, which, uh, forced you into going digital, but what would you say to the clinicians who haven't yet pulled the trigger on going digital? Well, I'd say it's time. I, I held off, not because I was a skeptic, but, but because I wanted to see that the science was there. And through the work of Dr. Ludlow and others, I see now that at least with PrimeScan, uh, we are at that uh, definitive moment, a bit like the sort of VHS or Betamax moment. So uh, I think we're there and I think people should embrace the technology. Wow, convinced me for sure. <laughs> All right, my second question for you is, can you explain during your presentation, you said there was no loss of preload. What did you mean by that with the Atlantis abutment? So preload is the clamping force that's achieved between the abutment and the, the, the implant when you apply a torque. So everybody understands that the higher the torque, the higher the force being used to tighten the screw. And by definition, uh, the more force being used to tighten the screw, the more clamping force there is across the implant abutment uh, interface or junction. The problem is that very typically with mechanical components, uh, after a short period of time, it's possible for what, what in engineering terms is called settling uh, to take place, which results in a loss of the clamping force or a loss of the preload. The preload is that clamping force. And when there's a loss of preload, the risk is that the abutment screw can then become a little bit loose. And so I've always, before Atlantis abutments came along, uh, I've always checked uh, typically about three months uh, after placement to see that the clamping force, that the preload hasn't been lost. And how do I check that? Quite simply by ensuring that the screw is tight to 25 Newton centimeters. Now, what happens is that on some rare occasions, perhaps where the abutment has jammed up against a little peak of bone or something like that, um, what that means is that actually the joint wasn't completely seated. And so the preload ends up not being between the abutment and the implant, but rather between the abutment and the little peak of bone or fibrous gum or whatever it is. 
And as that remodels, then you get a loss of preload and the screw becomes loose. So by emphasizing that I didn't see any loss of preload, it tells me two very important pieces of information. Number one, it tells me that the emergence profile and the contour of these abutments is so precise and so good that there is less risk for it effectively impinging upon uh, the anatomy, the surrounding anatomy, the hard and soft tissues. And secondly, it tells me that the conical seal within the uh, EV connection is so uh, precise that we don't get much, if any, settling of the joint after we initially torque that abutment screw to 25 newton centimeters. So it is extremely rare that I find that the abutment screw comes loose. Crystal clear, thank you. That was perfect, it made a lot of sense. One last question for you. So how long would you say it took you to become completely proficient or competent at intraoral scanning? Proficiency in terms of speed takes time, but that's only a comfort thing, getting used to the technology. But the prime scan is so intuitive and so capable as a piece of equipment that even your very first scans tend to be, or at least in my experience, I found them to be a very high quality. I just took longer than I might otherwise take now to do the same thing. Thank you. That's great. And, and we'll, we'll work on this later, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. Yeah. Welcome. It's been a pleasure to join you. You as well. Why it was such a game changer was because this was kind of the first time that we had something accurate enough that I felt really comfortable doing full arch implant restorative work on. Is this scanner accurate enough or can I do these more high-end implant restorative work? I completely hear everyone from the skeptical side because I felt that exact way myself. But I can honestly tell you from doing the research on these things that it does work and it is incredible that you can actually do these type of workflows and get very, very predictable results. When the Prime Scan came out, we were honestly just blown away with how accurate it was, especially from a full arch perspective and a cross arch perspective, that, you know, we kind of all looked at each other and we went, well, here we've got it. Where you gain a lot of freedom from using the Prime Scan scan, it doesn't mean you have to completely change what you're doing. You can take the workflows that you currently use and augment them with the Prime Scan. When you put the patient up and you let them see their scans, they've never looked at their teeth that way ever. And they start to understand things that they've never been able to understand before, even though multiple other providers may have told them the same thing. When they can actually see it on a screen, it makes a huge difference to them from a case acceptance perspective and a case understanding perspective. I hope you all enjoyed the Prime Scan video. I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of clinicians across the country, and I haven't heard a single negative review. So that brings us to our second speaker of the day, Dr. Mark Ludlow. We are so excited to have Mark with us to showcase what can be done with the digital workflow for full arch restorations, which is truly exciting. Joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, please welcome Dr. Mark Ludlow. Thanks, Lisa. I'm absolutely happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for allowing us to, to have this lecture. Uh, what we're going to go through today is we're going to try to think differently in the way that we go about treating our full arch fixed implant patients. So really excited to present this to you today. I think a lot of the times us as dentists, we tend to think the same. We treat people the same way. We do things in very similar manners. And it can be a very difficult thing for a lot of patients to discern our practices from every other practice that surrounds them. And it's for that exact reason that I would really like us to think differently. 
Now, we're going to look at three different ways we can think differently in this presentation. We're going to think differently about the way we do our diagnostics and about using allogenic impressions or standard impressions on day one with our patients. We're going to think differently about the way we do surgery and just not flapping the case open, planing the bone, and going ahead and putting the implants in. And we're going to think very differently about the way that we do the final restorative work for this type of treatment. So let's begin with this. How can we think differently about the diagnostics? And what I want us to start off thinking about is this, is why do we start out this way with our patients? Why do we begin a relationship with our patients by starting off with an allogenic impression or another type of impression this way? Because if you look at the data by Hacker, and there's a variety of other people that look at this as well, there are certain things that our patients just really don't like getting in the dental chair. And we know what the most, what the biggest one and the thing that they dislike the most is, and that's the injection. We understand that. But if you look at this, the second thing that they dislike the most and on the same order of magnitude as the injection is actually receiving impressions. Now, this is one of those things that we're just all so used to that we don't even think about it, but this truthfully is something that our patients don't like, and that's for that reason that we want to create a different patient experience. If you also look at some of the intraoral scanning data by this paper from 2014 and this Brzezinski paper from 2018, what they show is overwhelmingly, when it comes to initial impressions, patients prefer receiving an intraoral scan for that initial visit versus receiving a conventional impression. And the Brzezinski paper is an interesting one because it also showed that patients would seek out providers that provided this type of care with an intraoral scan. And that's the first thing that we want to be able to do with our patients is we want to create a different patient experience for our full arch patients and start off that patient experience with an intraoral scan. Now with these, we need to make sure that we're scanning all of the anatomy that we're going to need for full art. So we're going to spend a lot of time making sure that we get all the soft tissue that we're getting back behind the teeth. If we need to get back to the tuberosity regions or on the lower to the retromolar pad areas, we need to make sure we're getting all those different areas so that we can have all the information to be able to move forward from a full arch arena. Now, especially here in the front, I usually try to get the mucogingival junction very well so we can see where the soft tissue is and where the mucosa is, and then we get the palate and the rest of things to go from there. And it's not just capturing the anatomy and making sure that we get a good pre-op scan, but it's also using our scanner in such a way that it will actually ensure that we're getting the best possible, most accurate digital model out of that. And we've actually spent a lot of time researching these things as to how to best scan these cases. And when we look at this, basically what we've found is the most reliable thing for the vast majority of scanners is the following. We usually start off going all the way through the lingual of the entire arch and really setting the arch that way. Then we come back from an occlusal perspective and then the third pass is going from a facial perspective. And then we're going to fill in any little voids, any little gaps, any spots that we've missed in those initial passes through that time. Once that gets set, then we're going to go ahead and fill in the palate and fill in the soft tissue. And this can be best done either this way where we're going back and forth, or you can go straight down the mid palatine suture and then roll up from either side to fill in the rest of the stuff. But what this allows us to do is it allows us to get the most accurate possible scan because this is the basis of every single thing that we do moving forward. And it's not just getting this very accurate scan, but what we also want to do with our patients as part of creating this different patient experience for them is we want to then sit them up and show them what is actually going on in their mouth because they've never seen their mouth this way before, and we can really help them make sense of some of the problems that we have. They've never seen a frication like that in their mouth before. They've never seen how tightly their teeth come together, and that's the reason why there's bone loss, and the teeth are worn down and they're moving. And it really makes the patient understand what is going on significantly better in their mouth and helps with a very different, helps create a very different patient experience for them. Now, we take all of those things that we take on that first visit, which is our preoperative scan, and we take a CBCT 
of our patient at that very first visit. And then what we do from there is we will go ahead and make a full contour wax up of our teeth, either us or our lab partners, and then we're going to merge it all together in Simplet. Because in my honest estimation, I think surgery and diagnostics and pros are all one thing to treat our patients. Sometimes we think of them as different modalities, but all they are is they all come together to be one byproduct so that we can go ahead and treat our patients the best way forward. Now, looking at doing things differently from a patient experience, again, with the surgery is this way. Once we have it all integrated together in Simplant, we can sit down with our patients, show them what their preoperative condition is, show them where they're going to go with the teeth that we want to put in there, correcting their occlusal plane and whatever things that we need to do there. And then depending if they really want to get in and know all the nitty gritties of their treatment or not, we can go ahead and show them how we're going to create the space for the restoration and how we're going to get the implants in exactly the spots that they want through our surgical guide. And what this does is this really helps get the patients on board with this type of treatment and gets patient buy-in and moving forward and creating a very different patient experience for them. The other thing that this allows us to create a different experience is, is in our referral process, because we can do the exact same thing and make these videos and send them over to our referring docs and say, look, thank you for sending over Mrs. Jones, Dr. Smith. What we're going to do is this is where we're going to place the implants. These are the types of abutments we're going to put on. These are all the areas that we're concerned about and we're looking at. And if you get to an area that really concerns you, you can go ahead and spend some time on that, change the view on it so you can look at it. Again, this one, she has a, a moderately large incisive canal. And so we can say, look, we're going to put this here so it's away from the incisive canal. And this is the type of treatment that we're going to do on your patient. Thank you so much for the referral. And it's a very different experience than just sending over the sheet of paper say, hey, we saw your patient. Thanks for the referral. We're going to do some implants on you. Now, besides creating these different experiences for our patients and for our referring docs, why would we want to use a guided modality versus doing it how we've always done, which is just opening up the arch, flattening the bone, and placing the implants? Well, if you look at the data on these things, we'll begin with a paper by Jonas. And I really enjoy this paper because what they have in this one is they've looked, they've compared freehand surgery to pilot guides to fully guided surgery. And what you can see when you look at the apical global deviation, that's how much it off, is off from the plan. We see that fully guided surgery is significant, will get your implant significantly closer to where you have planned it than we can achieve with freehanded surgery to the tune of about one millimeter from fully guided to about two millimeters with free-handed surgery. And again, this holds up in most of the systematic reviews you see out there as well on these things. Now, I think one of the best papers that has been written on this topic actually comes from Burke Croyson from 2014, and they did the same thing. They looked at full arch treatment, fully guided on our left, fully freehand in the middle, and then what they called template assisted, which was a duplicate of the denture or a pilot guide. And what they looked at was the similar things. When you look at the lateral deviations of these things, again, about a millimeter or so from the fully guided, roughly about two millimeters, a little over two millimeters for the freehand and 1.77 from the template assisted or pilot guides. And similar thing, we're closer on the depth as well. Three quarters of a millimeter for guided, 1.25 for freehand and a little over two for the pilot assisted. That's why on our particular patient, I chose to move to a guided surgery for her because again, we really wanted these things in a very precise location to support the teeth. And it not only is, is good for our patients from an accuracy perspective, but when you look at Yana's papers, Al Marfini's papers, multiple other papers, fully guided surgery is actually more efficient from a time perspective as well. And it's not just the surgery time that I'm I'm concerned about and that is important to me. What also is important to me is the actual provisionalization of these cases. Because to be truly honest, that's honestly where my treatment begins to slow down and it takes me more time is in the conversion prosthesis step in building the provisionals for the patients at the time of surgery. 
And what we can do with our Simplant plans through Atlantis is Atlantis is able to provide for us this file called the Immediate Smiles digital file. And what we're able to do with that file is they send us multiple, multiple files like we see here to be able to create our pre-op provisionals before we've even laid a hand on the patient. And what these different files are, if you see on the right at showing where our abutments, and again, we're planning these things with our final smart fix abutments on there, but it's showing exactly where our abutments are coming through. The middle one is showing where it's coming through relative to the bone. And the, in, on the left is where our wax up is. We can combine all those together in laboratory software to go ahead and design provisionals that have ready-made holes already in there so that it can make the provisionalization of these cases much more predictable and much more efficient from a time perspective. Now, the patient wears that, the patient goes out and heals, and then we get to the restorative aspect. Now, I think this is where, to be truly honest, most of us all think the same. Okay, we go on this general path flow, this general workflow with all of our patients. We take conventional impressions, we make a model, we have our verification jig, we go ahead and make a wax rim. All this stuff gets sent to the lab to be able to create the bar. The bar comes back for trying. We sometimes do a bite on that. Then we have our wax trying. And then finally, we get to our final. My goal today is to hope that we can think differently about how we can do these things, okay? And the ironic thing about all of this is there are multiple steps where these are now going in scanners to be scanned to create that bar, to create the teeth and do all the different things there. And so it's at this point that I think that we should be looking at doing these cases completely digital. Now, I know to a lot of you that are watching this, this is something that you all just kind of go, can't believe he's talking about this, and this can be blasphemy in a lot of circles. And to be truly honest, I thought that way as well. But these scanners have become so accurate, and we'll look at that in a minute, they become so accurate that we can reliably do these cases from a digital perspective. Now, how do we do it? How you begin is you're going to want to scan the upper, the lower, and the bite on this particular patient, okay? Because the uppers are conversion prostheses. Okay, we're going to scan those two different, those three different things before we start scanning anything relative to the implants. And one of the key things when you're scanning these cases is when you scan the opposing arch, always use your articulating paper, have them go tap, 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 tap. That way you can verify that those marks are the same as they are when, you're, when your models come together digitally. That way you've got a verified bite before the patient actually leaves the chair. And that's something we've never been able to do before. And we start off with these scans this way, because if you look at our paper from 2019 in JURD, what you see is this. We were looking at cross arch accuracy and accuracy of scanning with a bunch of different scanners and a bunch of different restorative materials. And when you look at these box plots, what you basically want is the smaller the things are, the more accurate things are. And when you look at the prime scan, when we looked at the cross arch accuracy of the prime scan, so going from second molar all the way to second molar, it was down to 18 microns for cross arch accuracy on these dentate scans. And that's why we begin scanning the conversion prosthesis or scanning the temporary of the patient so that we can set this model in such a way this digital model in such a way that it is the most accurate scan that we can possibly get. After we have all that set that way, it's a matter of merging all the other scans to it. So we scan the soft tissue and then we put on the scan bodies and go ahead and scan the scan bodies. And the key with this is, again, this is sped up to uh, 1.5 times just because we've got limited time on this. But we want to make a really accurate, good scan, just like you would want to take a really accurate impression. You want to get all the soft tissue, you want to get the palette so that everything matches back together, and you want to make sure that you get your scan bodies scanned well and together on these things. And what it allows us to do is this allows all the different scans to line up so that we can have everything cross arch mounted at the occlusion which you've already worked out and at the vertical that you've already worked out as well 
so that you can get a very predictable result, get a very nice passive fitting bar and restorative work because these scanners are just that accurate. Now, if we have a case like this where we don't have a bar or we don't have a conversion prosthesis or anything like this, in our study that is just in its final round of finishing for the journal, we've shown that you can get 43 microns of cross arch accuracy for just tissue and implant scans. And what this means for us is you can still get very passive restorations and bars made for this. Again, we had temporaries made that we put on both the physical model and the printed digital model, looked for any differences in that we could find in fit. There was no differences in fit. There was no differences in passivities. We had one temporary made up completely digital, one made off of the physical model. And again, when we tried both of them in the patient's mouth, again, from a fit perspective, there was no difference. From a passivity perspective, there was no difference. And again, we knew, and this is just one case, but we've shown now, this is the fourth different case, which we've shown working up this way, but we're able to get very nice restorations, very passive fitting restorations, because the scanners are just that accurate and the prime scan can get between that 18 and 40 microns of cross arch accuracy, depending on what you're scanning. That way we can get very predictable results for our patient who you saw me scanning earlier. And I think the whole purpose of this that I hope you've been able to glean from this is that from the full arch perspective, we can think differently and get very remarkable results and remarkably different patient experiences for our patients so they can tell that your practice is different than every other practice that surrounds them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for that fabulous presentation, as always. I remember the first time years ago I saw you present. Uh, I was in front of a really prestigious audience, and uh, one of the members tried to stump you with a technology question. You weren't phased at all. In fact, you kind of went in more depth than any of us could truly understand. So today, I'm just going to ask you a couple basic questions. Perfect. Yeah, I still remember that one. So don't don't field me that that question because that was a doozy. So. You did great. Uh, so how does this fully digital workflow benefit our patients? Most importantly, I think the way that it helps your patient the most is it just it allows them to see their mouth in a way in which they've never seen it before. They're able to look at their situation. They're able to look at the teeth. And they're able to look at the wax up and different things that you have planned for them. And I really think it helps them understand what's going on and really kind of take ownership of what's going on in their mouth. So I think it really just helps them educate themselves on what their mouth is and how to move things forward. From the clinical perspective, one, it, it, it helps make your practice different than every other practice out there. And I think that's a huge thing when it comes to kind of practice building and practice management. Secondarily, I think it helps us from a predictability and efficiency standpoint because we're able to do surgeries faster, we're able to do the provisionalization faster, the conversions faster, and we're able to get really predictable final restorative work done in an extremely efficient way. And I think, you know, there's multiple, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, but there's multiple ways that it can really help us. Less stress for us. I love that for yeah. sure. <laughs> Yeah, anything that can make our, our daily life easier in the trenches, I think, is, is the important part. So over at MUSC, I know you have access to every single piece of technology that exists, which is why you're so knowledgeable. Um, but when would you choose the prime scan above all others? Which, which indications? So, I mean, to be honest, I use it all the time. But I think the, the two areas where I use it the absolute most would be one is in my single visit dentistry, just because, I mean, it's so efficient from a scanning perspective, from a designing milling perspective, like I love it for that aspect because it's, it's, it's extremely quick and predictable. And I think where it really does shine from the implant perspective is in these full arch cases. Because when we've looked at it from an accuracy perspective, it has, this machine is so darn accurate that we're almost getting to where we're rivaling lab scanners. And when I scan a patient with this, with the prime scan, I know exactly what I'm getting back. I know it's going to fit well, it's going to be passive, and we're going to be able to register all the contours, all the look, everything that we need for our final restoration. And we get a really predictable 
well-fitting result from the scanner. Thank you. So uh, another question. So your publications show patients prefer intraoral scan over conventional. However, I, <laughs> in my personal experience, a couple times have had patients state quite the opposite. I'm sure it's because I'm less skilled than you at this scanning, but how long would you say it takes for you to become really proficient? It's the same question I asked Dr. Norton as well. You know, I think the thing you have to realize about scanning or any of the digital modalities when you start using them is it's a new skill set. It's things that you haven't done before. And so you have to give yourself a little bit of slack and a little bit of time to learn that new skill set. And, you know, if you look at, Lim has a publication on this and just what we've seen with our students and residents, you know, by the time you hit maybe about 10, 15 scans or so, by that time you're pretty darn proficient. You've kind of figured out the nuances, you've figured out the issues that you have. And by that time, you've, you've pretty much got it down. Really smart. Thank you so much again for your time today. I always learn so much from you, Mark. No problem. Thanks for having me. It's great being here. Thank you all for attending our first session. And thank you again to our wonderful speakers, Drs. Michael Norton and Mark Ludlow. We look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow for our next session, Let's Talk Regeneration. We have three world-class experts who will present their patients and discuss different treatment options, including the importance of implant design, graft material selection, and most importantly, their proper clinical use. Have a great night and we will see you tomorrow.